Well, here we go. All right, we're finally getting toward the end of the day. We've had a great, uh, I think, a pretty good summit so far. A lot of good, interesting speakers. Um, I know more about ERCOT and what's going on with the electric grid than I ever wanted to know. Of course, I learned a lot about that in, the, in real time earlier this year, like a lot of you in this room have, too. All right, so, um, you know, there's once, a, I guess it's quite a few years ago, a renowned meteorologist said that uh, Texas weather is uh, really just long extended drought that with intermittent flood. And so we've talked about all of the drought so far, so now it's time to talk about flood and what we can do about it, which we all know we can't do anything about it. We just respond to it. That's what we do, sort of like a lot of other things in life. But thanks for spending your day here at the Infrastructure Summit. I'm Kevin Ward. I'm the general manager for Trinity River Authority, in case you didn't, you weren't early, here earlier. And I'm also the secretary of the North Texas Commission, which is why I get the last spot of introduction this afternoon, because I'm the secretary. Uh, we have uh, heard uh, from so many <laughs> great speakers today, and we have at least this one last panel discussion is prepared for you uh, before you go. And we've listened to a lot of information on long-term water planning, the needs of the region, and their use. But we just really haven't heard about this yet. So we're really proud to sponsor this event as the Trinity River Authority, where this is our panel that we sponsored. And I'll start introducing the, uh, the panelists. And I'm going to start in the middle here. Mr. Greg Waller graduated from Texas A&M University in 1992 with a Bachelor of Science degree in meteorology. After working for a private firm in Houston for two years, Greg joined the National Weather Service in May 1994. Gray worked at the offices across Texas, at different offices across Texas before joining the West Gulf River Forecast Center in December 2000. At West Gulf, Greg worked both as a hydrologist and a senior hydrometeorological an analysis and support forecaster. I've got it right. Okay. Before his promotion as service coordination hydrologist in May 2015. Greg's duties are to serve as a liaison and lead the coordination efforts of the, R, of the River Forecast Center into the future. Glenn Cleaningpill is the Executive Manager of Technical Services and Basin Planning for the Trinity River Authority of Texas. That's us, that's right. So Mr. Cleaningpill holds an undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Texas. He also holds a master's degree in environmental sciences and business administration, and another one from business administration from the U University of Texas at Arlington, and the first one from University of North Texas. He holds an undergraduate degree in French language and culture and attended at, all right, I'm going to say this, and if I butcher it, you correct me, uh, La Sorbonne? La Sorbonne. La Sorbonne. Okay. La Sorbonne University in Paris, France. That's right, ladies, he was in Paris. Okay. He joined the uh, Trinity River Authority in 1998 and has served in a number of positions that have included everything from technical field work to serving as executive assistant to the general manager. In his current role, Mr. Clingingfield manages a team of scientists and engineers focused on understanding the water quality, ecology, and course hydrology of the Trinity River. In addition to serving as a chairman for the Region 3 Flood Planning Group, Mr. Clingingfield serves as the chair of the Galveston Bay Council, the North Central Texas Council of Governments Water Resources Council, and the Texas Water Conservation Endangered Species Committee. Quite busy. Uh, now we have Mr. Colby Wal 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 Walton. Mr. Colby Walton. He brings over two decades of specialized experience in professional services and with B2B marketing and municipal communications. He draws on this expertise to guide the agency's law firm, financial services, government, and infrastructure clients on their most critical PR and marketing issues. Colby has represented many of Texas's and the nation's most prestigious professional services firms and top city governments. Colby graduated cum laude from Duke University and completed his JD at the University of Virginia Law School, subsequently earning his license to practice in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So our speakers will begin with a brief presentation, then Colby will lead us to a moderated discussion. Gentlemen, the stage is yours. Do this the right way. Yes, excellent. So, first success is I've got the clicker going the right way. Um, this is going to be different for me. If y'all know my speaking style, I get very energetic, animated, and I like pacing around a lot. So, being constrained to behind a podium is going to be something different for me. My name is Greg Waller. Uh, if we've ever met, uh, everyone calls me Wally. 
just from the sheer number of Gregs that seem to be running around right now. Uh, out of 15 people at the West Gulf River Forecast Center, we had four by the name of Greg working at the same time. My college roommate was Greg, and the best man at my wedding was Greg, and they were not the same individual. So, hi, I'm Wally. Uh, I work for the National Weather Service. I've got degrees in meteorology. However, the last 21 years of my life have been more in the river forecasting and the hydrology. And um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to insult some of you, all of you. And I'm going to tell you how to prepare for yourself so the next time we meet, you say, hey, Wally, uh, stop it, man, stop it. Uh, the best thing I can do is I say I'm a clearinghouse. I gather all the information that I can get from any partner whatsoever, um, and we put that into our forecast. We put that into our river forecast, our height. We'll do uh, data for meteorology. Uh, we'll do climate data. We do whatever we can. But the Weather Service doesn't own most of the data. Uh, we rely on our federal partners. Uh, you'll see you know, Corps of Engineers, USGS, FEMA. Uh, our regional partners, uh, you know, Trinity River Authority, Tarrant Regional Water District, those types, uh, state level partners, uh, Texas Emergency Management is a big one because of, they take our forecast and make life-saving decisions on it. Um, there's an international component, the Rio Grande uh, is technically the responsibility of the National Weather Service, so 87,000 square miles of drainage in Mexico, and we have to deal with the Mexican Weather Service and the water authorities, and um, you can even see uh, on the, the far right side that there's a burnt orange symbol on there. So even as an Aggie, we will work with academia, uh, University of Texas, University of Texas, Arlington, uh, Prairie View A&M, a lot of schools like that. Uh, just whatever we can do to get the information out. So um, I am a sci-fi nerd. Um, so I'm going to start off with one from the old movie Dune. Uh, the first step in avoiding a trap is knowing of its existence. Um, risk uh, here is equals threat times vulnerability. Why am I saying all this? Um, if you want to know who is responsible every time it floods in Texas, it's you, because you built here. Mother Nature has been dropping the rainfall forever. We're the ones that put vulnerable structures and vulnerable people in its way. So since you've done that, you need to take the responsibility of planning for it. Uh, you need to know everything at all times about everything. And I'm, I'm not being facetious there. There's the, the meteorology, the hydrology is constantly changing. Um, and it's just little stuff. I gave a talk at the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. A lady came up after me, she goes, oh, we just bought some, some land and we built a house and when we came back three months later, there was 300 houses there. What do you do with that? I said, well, I cry because you just took a wide open field and you added 100% runoff and faster runoff on every rooftop and every you know, concrete driveway, everything like that. You have to be prepared because the storm that dropped the rain 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if it drops that same rank now, it's gonna be a different flood. Mother Nature is going to deliver it. You need to know everything, everywhere at all times. So the risk is the threat, and the threats, I mean, it's a heavy rain event, and your vulnerability. Your vulnerability changes, and the vulnerability around you changes constantly. So I say information is your shield, be prepared, but we know from all the sci-fi movies, your shields eventually fail, and be prepared for that as well. So. I found this set of slides here. It's the Dallas-Fort Worth area and how much it's changed. Uh, I left the area, I was born in Middle Wells, but I was raised on the north side of Houston. And when I moved in 1979, 1980, you know, there's a lot of places now that I remember being wide open fields and it's just row upon rows of houses and subdivisions now. And you look at the change from 1979 uh, to 1989 and then to 2003, I mean, there are lakes that have been built in the DFW area from 1979 to you know, 2003. And then I tried to grab a more recent one and just the urban sprawl. I mean, it's the what, fourth largest metropolitan area in the nation. It overtook Houston because Houston is you know, confined by the Gulf of Mexico. It can't spread any further southeast. But you know, just think of the amount of people and the amount of, of concrete that has changed the runoff characteristics in the Dallas-Fort Worth area alone. And that's all going to funnel right through into the Trinity River. It's going to go all the way down to Lake Livingston. And what's Lake Livingston going to do with it then? Um, what I like comparing it to is um, Harvey and Houston. You know, Houston, you can see a big spread out metropolitan area there. Um, I know that there's a, there was a meme with a little baby Yoda saying, you know, I'm about to lose it because it took me two hours to drive from Houston to Houston. Okay, just getting across the urban sprawl. Um, but what I want to point out about Houston and Harvey, I, this is the hill I'm going to die on. Harvey was not an unprecedented event. Okay, okay, it was not an unprecedented storm. It was a major hurricane, made landfall on the northwest Gulf Coast, sat at about 30 degrees north latitude for several days, dropped rainfall that that area had never seen and produced flooding that that area had never seen before. 
Okay? That was actually Alex 2010 I just described. I have worked that event. I have worked a Harvey. It just happened to be on the other side of the Rio Grande. It is going to happen again, so don't call it unprecedented. What made it unprecedented was we put a huge vulnerability, a huge you know, footprint for Mother Nature to drop an extreme amount of rain in a fairly short period of time uh, and, and produce the flooding. And we need to be prepared for that. Even up here in the Dallas Fort Worth area, we get remnants of tropical storms up here. So we need to be prepared for that. It was unprecedented impacts, but it was not an unprecedented event, and we need to be prepared for another one. So with that, know your watershed. Everyone's just like, those lakes reducing all that water, that's what caused me to flood. Or, or when, it, when it flooded and when it rained in, in, in Dallas-Fort Worth, that's what caused me to flood. It's like, well, you know, if it rained on Dallas-Fort Worth, the first thing that's going to stop it is Lake Livingston because there's not a lake and there's nothing there on the way. But if it rains around Dallas-Fort Worth, you know, there's reservoirs in place, and it's my job to know who owns it, why, what are you going to do with that water, and when you do release it, let me know so I can put it in my river forecast model. But the point is, is that, you know, you need to know. If it rains in certain areas, there might be a lake there to catch it and help it. And if it rains in the Dallas-Fort Worth area specifically, anywhere in the metro area, there's nothing really going to stop it. Okay, it's not going to stop until it gets to Lake Livingston, and then, you know, I'll call up those folks down there and say, what are you going to do for there to, to send it all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico? So, it's complex. I counted in our reservoir, on our river model that we run, there are 15 different lakes that could have a release impact that I would have to coordinate when I put out my river forecast. Okay, and it is the, you know, did the water come from local stormwater, or did Ben Brooks spill? Could it get the emergency spillway? Or is it coming down from the Tarrant Regional Lakes because they don't have flood storage? Know where your water's coming from. There's a reason that lake is high. There's a reason that reservoir, that river's high. You know, find out why. Do a little homework, you know, wherever you're at in whatever municipality you are, find out what's around you, where would the flood water come from? This is the one that, that why am I here? Why am I talking? Um, this is the flood-related fatalities uh, from 2013 to 2018. And most of, the, of this is weighted from 2015 to 2018. And you can see that statewide, uh, the state of Texas easily outpaces the rest of the United States uh, in flood-related fatalities. Um, uh, we're number one, and most, you can say a lot of it's attributed to Harvey, but I mean, every year there's someone that drives through a low water crossing in the hill country. There's someone that gets caught at a creek on, you know, on a stream up here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, but you can just see that, that we, you know, if you add up number two, number three, and number four, Texas still has more flood-related fatalities. And you know, this is, gives you a kind of a distribution of the flash flood alley, uh, the I-35 corridor, what goes on in Houston, but, you know, even all the way up here in the Dallas-Fort Worth, and, and you can even extend it up uh, into Oklahoma. You know, we get just intense rainfall events that cause flash flooding and that, that cause fatalities. Uh, so I went ahead and pulled the data from last week, and you can see that uh, Texas is not in the lead in this point. Um, it is Tennessee from the catastrophic flooding they had just recently. I've been told that that number 30 has been reduced to 28. So there's, you know, 28 flood-related fatalities in, in Tennessee, but that's so far this year. But even then, you know, we've had some rain, but we've had some periods of breaks, but we've still had six flood-related fatalities in the state of Texas. So that means I'm going to get up here and talk until I'm blue in the face because that's the job of the National Weather Service. Protect lives and protect property by issuing forecasts and observations, which include river forecasts and rainfall forecasts. So our process. I'm expected to put out a forecast, you know, five days out to a tenth foot accuracy with Mother Nature doing their thing. That ain't going to happen. It's my goal, but it ain't going to happen. So what we do is when we're five to seven days out, that's a good time for you to make short-term plans and family plans. We're going to give you outlooks. Hey, there's a heavy rain threat coming in this way. You need to watch it. And as we get to the two to three day time frame, we'll start running our probabilistic models and, and try to get an idea of, of what are the chances, trying to, to fine tune it so that when we're 24 hours out or so, when we, the National Weather Service, issues a flood warning, that means the river is out of its banks, it's having an impact on humans, please make your preparations now. So we go, we call it the ready, set, go method. Big picture, get you, get you alerted, get you warned on it. Medium picture, okay, what, we, our, our plans need to be you know, taken into account. Small picture, make your life-saving decision at this point. Now, in doing so, we're gonna use terminology. Just because the river is out of its banks does not mean it's a flood in National Weather Service terminology. Um, if it's above and has minor impacts, say you've designed uh, at your watershed, you've put up a, a city park or a golf course right there and it gets into that area, we'd call that minor flooding. Maybe a secondary road, but you can go around it and find another one. So it's when the river gets out of its banks and has an impact on humans. 
So, you know, if you know your, your infrastructure design, uh, minor flooding is a nuisance, but hopefully no one's losing their life. When we start saying moderate flooding, that means we're, roads are underwater and we're threatening buildings, buildings that weren't supposed to be there. And when we say major flooding, there's water in buildings and we're shutting down major highways. And obviously record flooding means it's never been this high before. And so when the Weather Service issues terminology, when we say river flooding, you know, it's the river's out of its banks and, and it's having an impact. And as you go up the color scale, the threats and the impacts are going up as well. One thing that we are trying to branch out on are flood inundation maps because I can put out a height forecast for the Trinity River at Dallas. It's going to be 33.5 feet in five days and someone goes, so what? So we are trying to pull out flood inundation maps and what we found out is you better have accurate data and you better have someone in house that knows what they're looking at and can explain it to you because a lot of bad decisions can be made if the flood inundation map is off just a little bit, but you don't have the individual in place that can say, hey, you know, this was a, an assumption here, or no, there's been a levy put in here, this is no longer the case, Let, let's take this out. So you need to have someone with situational awareness to know that when a flood inundation map comes out, there's always subtle little changes. Uh, figure it out and then pass it back on to us, and we've got a group at the National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama to help work on that. But flood inundation map is the future. I didn't think we would be there in my career. Well, I've got seven more years left in my career, and uh, this is the, the new paradigm. One picture is worth a thousand words. That gets you a lot more information than Trinity River at Dallas is 33.3 feet. Another thing, we just gathered a ton of data. Uh, the last time this thing was updated was 1970, but we released the NOAA Atlas 14, and it was able to capture Harvey. It was able to capture all the rain events. Now, the goal, and I learned from the Corps of Engineers that if you have a uh, hundred year flood, for it to be accurate, you need about 300 to 400 years of data. Well, you know, Texas hasn't been around 340, I mean, 1836, you know, whatever like that, but even then, our, our recognizable science, we've only been around about 100 years, so the 100 year flood, the 500 year flood, the 100 year rain event, the 500 year flood uh, rain event, we have to use statistics to expand on it. So when we grabbed the data from 1970 to about 2016, 2017, expanded it, we created a more accurate NOAA Atlas 14 that will give you better 100-year events, 100-year rain events, uh, an idea on it. And where we really saw the increase was Southeast Texas went up, basically all along I-10 went up as well. So the 100-year rain event is now uh, more rain uh, for those areas because we've gra gathered 30 to 40 years more data. Grab it, pull that data down, get your engineers and the hydrologists to study it so you can come up with, with possible 100-year floodplains. But get an idea, we've got better information, let's, let's use it to make it for our planning purposes. So operationally, we use this method here where we take the rain on the ground, which you know, it can be a radar, it can be a rain gauge, it can be satellite, and we do a future forecast of rainfall. It's gotten so much better in my career. Uh, when I first started, six, 12 hours, future rainfall, that's about it. We can go 24 to 36 hours now with the same accuracy as what we had with just six hours of rainfall. But it's Texas. One thunderstorm pops up in Fannin County and hits which lake is it going to hit? Is it going to hit Boat Ark or is, I mean, it's going to Ray All or whatever. The, the variability in just one county, our weather models are getting better, but they're not that good. And we've learned that at about the 36 hour mark, uh, we've we got too many false alarms at that point because we missed an entire river basin. Uh, you know, and that's what I explain. I'm standing at my office and I look north. That rain would be Denton Creek at Justin, but if I look just five degrees off to my northwest, that, that rain would be Lake Worth. Um, so, you know, just being a little bit off on the rainfall placement really matters. Uh, we take into account soil moisture all the time. And then, the, like you said, reservoir releases. And when that d happens, we put out a time series forecast and then we alert the media. So when the National Weather Service issues warnings, you know, we've gathered into account all of this information. Now, it helps to know what we're forecasting for. You know, uh, kid's a Boy Scout and one of his hiking methods is uh, you gotta do a hike that's a thousand foot change in elevation. I said, good, we'll start you in Galveston and you can walk to Dallas-Fort Worth and to Decatur. Cause that's about a thousand foot change in elevation, give or take. Uh, but gravity still works in our favor and you can see that, that, you know, as you get closer to the coast, it flattens out and that means it slows down our routings. Um, multiple lakes in the area. So you gotta know who's doing it. And you know, technically, Lake Livingston is the water supply for Houston. So you know, our forecast impact the fourth largest metro area and the fifth largest metro area in the nation. Our radar is good. We have radars all over, you hear about it, but a radar beam shoots up a little bit off the ground. As it gets further away from the radar, it gets a little bit higher off the ground and we may miss some stuff going on. So radar is good. It gives us a great aerial representation of what's going on, but we really would like hourly real-time gauges 
underneath those radars so that we can provide the best estimate possible. Because as you see, as you get far away, especially in that area around Crockett uh, that's inflows into Lake Livingston, um, our radar beam is over 10,000 feet off the ground. There's a lot of weather that can happen between zero and 10,000 feet off the ground. So we really rely on, on, uh, on rain gauges to help us fill those gaps. So we do a multi-sensor process. If there's a rain gauge that's accurate, we'll zone it in and, and calibrate it to the radar estimate at the time. And if there's neither one, we'll put a satellite estimate in there. The theory being is that, that if you glom them all together, that's a superior product. And so you can trust that if you download data, the rainfall data from the National Weather Service that's observed, it's 90 to 95 percent, you know, the gold standard. There's going to be some gaps, there's going to be a little bit on there, but we grab into, into all these images and then we have a human look through and do the quality control as well to, to make sure this is a superior product that goes into our hydrologic model, but the rainfall data can be downloaded at your uh, needed uh, at a later time. Um, this gives you an idea of the number of hourly related rain gauges in, the, in, in Texas. I you know, put the yellow boundaries on there for basins. You can see we've got good coverage in the Dallas Fort area, but it gets kind of light if you get between Dallas and Houston. And then if you look down in the Austin San Antonio area, the lower Colorado River Authority has enough rain gauges. You could walk from San Angelo to, to the Gulf and never hit the ground. So I think that's a little bit overkill, but I'll take all the data. I'm a scientist. Give me the data and we'll, we'll make the best product possible. But this gives you an idea of some of our shortcomings when you get out of the Dallas-Fort Worth area in that middle section of the Trinity. If there's flooding there, we're adding uncertainties in this process. I keep mentioning our model, our model, our model. It is done in-house. Our calibration is done in-house. It's a hydrologic model. Um, but all the parameters, and there's a soil moisture parameter for uh, impervious area. There's a vegetation parameter that, you know, in the summer takes out water, in the winter it doesn't take out water. Once something gets built, we have to go back and recalibrate. So every five years, we need to be recalibrating all of the entire state of Texas, 400,000 square miles of data, you know, uh, to, to recalibrate when land use changes. And then the last thing is, please, y'all are locals. Don't call me. Glenn calls me. When you're locals, we have the weather forecast offices. I told you I've got 400,000 square miles in the state of Texas, New Mexico, Rio Grande, the Sabine. But the 14 uh, weather forecast offices in my area, 10 have responsibility in the state of Texas. Know those 10. If you're up here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, Jennifer Dunn is the warning coordination meteorologist. But they just hired Dr. Amanda Schroeder as the service hydrologist. They are the point of contact. Then once you get down to about Crockett, it switches over. And Katie Landry is the service hydrologist. And Dan Riley is the warning coordination meteorologist down there. So you know, I, I like putting this slide up. You know, they're the ones that, that do the local impacts. They're the ones that will come out and say, hey, you know, let's survey this area around this river gauge because maybe we need to set a flood stage here. Uh, think of them as the flash flood water experts for the weather forecast office in the Dallas Fourth area. So uh, Amanda, and to be honest, they robbed her from our, our shop. We had her we, uh, for five years. So you know, she, I, I'm going to say she knows what she's doing because I trained her. But anyway, just know that you're, you're, who is your point of contact for the National Weather Service? And in the Trinity River area up here, in all, most of North Texas, that's Brazos River uh, as well. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Amanda Schroeder. So that's my 10 minutes because I want to be able to answer questions later on. That's my contact information, though. So if you have follow-up questions later on, say, hey, Wally, one, you're too caffeinated and you talk too fast, <laughs> slow down, then I can come back and, and, and answer those questions. But with that, Mr. Glenn. I don't think that was a statement, but uh, <laughs> perhaps accurate all, all the same. Um, I am going to be talking about the, the regional flood planning process, but I want to answer one of the questions you asked. What is Livingston going to do with all that water? Well, we're going to sell it to Houston, right, Kevin? <laughs> not, not to make light of the fact that we, did, we obviously do experience a lot of the, the downstream effects of all of the development that's up here. So uh, I want to hit on three things in the 10 to 15 minutes that I've got before we start fielding your questions. I do want to give you a little bit of the backstory uh, for the, for the uh, flood planning process, talk about the process itself, and then end up by just talking about some of the expectations, because managing the expectations, I think, has become one of my big, uh, big challenges through this whole process. So the backstory. I'm going to start back in 2011, because we had a decade uh, of really extraordinary weather, and it was bifurcated, right? We had five years of drought, followed by five years of rainfall. And that graphic there shows you the state of Texas and the counties that were in some form of drought. And you can see that almost all of it is in some angry, would you call that maroon color? Yeah. Um, there's an Aggie joke in there buried somewhere, but I can't quite, yeah. can't get my hands on it. 
uh, 2011. So that was the hottest, driest year on record. And, ju and just a caveat, because we hear this all the time, right? Worst on record. Well, what does that really mean? I mean, our records go back 150, 200 years. It depends on where you are, right? So we have to keep that in mind, right? The world's been around a lot longer than that. So when we say on record, that does mean something. It doesn't mean everything, because we're still trying to get a handle on the, the stochasticity that's inherent you know, in the weather, and it's not static, it's dynamic. So weather changes as well, right? So anyway, 2011, very hot, very dry, hottest and driest on record. That drought extended through the end of 2014. In some parts of the state, that five-year period became the new drought of record. That's just how bad it was. I don't think that's the case here in the Trinity River Basin. We still look to the 1950s, but especially in West Texas and parts of East Texas, uh, it, it set the new drought of record. So that's how extreme that drought was. And then came 2015. And you probably remember 2015, I know, I know Wally does. Uh, every day you would look at the radar and you would see another set of uh, frontal system storms coming through. That, it, that is a picture there of the Trinity River. It was miles and miles wide uh, as it was flowing down towards Lake Livingston. In uh, 2015 also we saw Wemberley, uh, obviously a, a catastrophic, uh, heartbreaking stories coming out of Wemberley, that flash flood. Um, then 2016, we had additional flooding, uh, the tax day flood down around Houston, you'll recall. Uh, 2017, this little storm called Harvey rolled up the coast. And 2018, in 2018, the storms happened later in the year, towards the fall, October. And that's actually typically our second wettest. You just look at average rainfall by month. October in this region is the second wettest month of the year. So that's the Llano River down there. And then just insult to injury, you know, we had Tropical Storm Imelda come up and dump uh, upwards of 40 inches of rain in parts of the lower Trinity Basin. So what, what this did, and this is really what I want to impress upon you, is we had five years of drought. That's enough time to get used to that dry condition. And then we had five years of epic rainfall. So it, it created this, and I'm going to use an, over, you know, an overused cliche, right, this perfect storm where it really it created this strong perception that, by golly, something has changed. What it also did was it created a tremendous appetite in Austin to do something about flooding. And so back in 2019, Senate Bill 8 was passed through the Texas legislature. That created the regional flood planning process, largely based on the very successful water planning process that we have in the state of Texas that is the envy of uh, most of the nation. Uh, that charged Senate Bill 8 with standing that up, and that was a really big task to try to get this regional planning process going. Legislature has us on a very, very tight time frame, so there was a lot of work to do by the Texas Water Development Board. They you know, began these groups in October uh, of just last year, and we've had a lot of work trying to stand these groups up and get going down the road so we can produce uh, these regional flood plans that then will roll into uh, the state flood, flood plan. So, like the water planning approach, this is also a bottoms-up approach. They broke the state up into these regions. Each one of these regions will create a regional uh, plan, and then that regional plan will then become part of the first ever state flood plan. And I think Wally's written for us, it's your fault. And <laughs> we'll probably have to be a little bit more politically correct than that, but I'm certainly going to vote for a chapter, at least, that says, you know, it's your fault. So here are the fifth excuse me, the 15 regional flood planning groups, uh, very close to the 16 that we have for the water planning groups. The big difference that you'll see is that these don't go by political boundaries. These go by hydrologic boundaries. And that was one of the lessons that we learned and we tried to carry over from the water planning process to the flood planning process. And um, one of the big reasons for that is that in case you don't know this, water flows downhill. So there's this really big upstream, downstream component. This was forefront in the minds of the legislators when they were crafting Senate Bill 8, and you'll see that just permeates the rules that Texas Water Development Board then used, you know, that thou shalt not harm thy neighbor, and that's one of the covenants that we have to live by when we're crafting this plan. To represent, and this is the same for each one of these regional groups, there are 12 interest categories that uh, represent diverse interests to make sure that everybody has a voice in this process. There's a very heavy public component to that too where we, we, we actively solicit comments from the public so that they can provide their input into this process. We just had, uh, just last week I guess it was, our second um, pre-planning meeting so the public can get in on the front end, front end of this process. 
And then each one of these groups has um, a, a, an administrator, political subdivision, TRA serves in that role. Uh, and then we've hired a consultant. Half is the primary consultant, though they're, they have uh, numerous uh, subconsultants, like Fries and Nichols and so on. Um, and then, like I said, each one of these will, will submit their regional plans. It'll get rolled up into that statewide plan. So here is the Trinity Basin. We saw that before. It's a pretty big, and I, I put this up here because this is the Region 3 uh, region, right? It's 18,000 square miles, uh, 16,000 stream miles. Um, goes from Cook County all the way in the north, all the way down to the Gulf Coast, Livers, Chambers counties down there. Touches 38 different counties, just to give you a, a sense of scale there. 32 major reservoirs in this region. So obviously, uh, you know, covers a lot of ground, a lot of um, diverse areas as well. Right, so what we're looking at here is the average precipitation, and this is a little bit dated. It doesn't have the most recent information. This stopped at 2010. I don't think that has moved a whole lot, maybe down in the coastal area. We go from about 29 inches in the northwestern corner. This is the same river basin, all the way down to over 60 inches, probably now, uh, in the far southwest portion, or southeast portion, excuse me. So, uh, you know, just a tremendous diversity. And we're looking at these new reservoirs that are being built. Of course, they're being built out to the east. We're not building a whole lot of new reservoirs out in West Texas, right? Because that's obviously East Texas is where that rainfall is occurring. We get our rainfall in a, a couple of different ways. We have a lot of these frontal systems that come through. That's where the majority of our rain systems come from, or the, rain, the precipitation comes from. We also have these convection systems. We saw a number of those this summer, kind of an atypical August with these convection events popping up. And I think they're all welcome um, as they cool down the temperatures and provide a little bit of precipitation for us. And then, of course, we have tropical storms. And those tropical storms don't just affect the coast. They can come all the way up, as we saw with Tropical Storm Bill that happened in, was it May of, uh, May of 2015? Yeah, it was just at the tail end of all of those those events that came through and just saturated the ground, and then here comes Tropical Storm Bill. I think by that time, uh, most of the core reservoirs were already filled to capacity, so that was kind of the, the nail in the coffin, so to speak. Uh, we've got the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You've heard a lot about the economics here. We've got about 7.8 million people uh, living in this region. It's a, it's a heavy service technology economy. But as soon as you get outside of that, it's largely agrarian. We've got a lot of row crop agriculture in the Blackland Prairies. And we've got a lot of pasture, rangeland, some silviculture, and rice. So a, a diverse economy throughout the basin. And so we have a pretty diverse set of stakeholders that represent the regional planning group. You can see them listed here. A couple of names you might uh, recognize. Um, Rachel Eichert was on the one of the panels this morning. So a really good quality group of individuals with a lot of experience and expertise that they're bringing to this process. Here are ex officio uh, members, and you'll notice one of those names as well. So there's really four different baskets of these ex officio members that bring their expertise to the table. The first are the state agencies. The second are councils of government. Those are our liaisons to all the municipalities. You can imagine if we had to uh, directly touch and interact with all of the municipalities in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, it would be an impossible task. So we've got the North Central Texas Council of Governments represented on the council, uh, and so they can do that heavy lifting for us. Um, we've got liaisons with adjoining coastal basins, regions five and six. And then finally, we have our federal agency partners. So what is this plan going to contain? Well, very similar to the water plan, right? The first thing we have to do is understand on the water planning side, it's what our needs are. On the flood planning side is where is our risk? Where is flooding happening now? And where is flooding likely to happen in the future? And what are the risks associated with that? Once we analyze those risks, we can come up with some mitigation strategies, projects, though I'm going to start my uh, expectation setting here. A lot of the, the first round, the needs that we're going to see coming out of this first plan are really going to be studies because if you don't aim, you can't hit the bullseye. So there's still a lot more analysis, investigations, and studies that, that need to be done. And then from that, then we can develop and select actions that will reduce um, those flood risks. Like the water planning process, this is also iterative, and I think this is one of the keys to the success of water planning. It, it works on a five-year process. So as we go through this, and those are the steps that I just talked about, and it's rolled into a state plan, the minute that state plan is adopted, we're going to start working on the next flood plan. And what that allows us to do is adapt. It allows us to adapt to new data and information that's coming in. It allows us to adapt to changes that are happening in development and also in climate and weather and as we get better, better science and better models. So um, you can see here the, those dates. 
the, the first regional plan is due in January of 2023. That is not a long time from now. So we've got a lot, again, a lot of work to do before then. And then the first state plan is due in September of 2024. So what should we expect out of this first plan? Well, we can expect to really increase our knowledge about flooding, weather, the dynamics, how all of these things tie together, um, consolidation of information and resources. Wally does a great job of getting all of those things together, but there's still a lot of other disparate pieces to this puzzle that can be brought together to help inform this total picture. It's going to make funding available, particularly to a lot of those rural counties, the unsophisticated counties that haven't been able to go after those dollars. Uh, it's going to understand, we're going to start to understand what we don't know, right? Getting to know what we don't know. Um, so those, those are, I think, what we can reasonably expect to come out of this first plan. I'm going to call that a win. I think that's going to be a, a major step forward in this process of getting our hands around flooding. What can we not expect? What this plan isn't going to do? It's not going to stop flooding. We're not going to end it all of a sudden, right? Um, there, it's not going to come up with a list of massive silver bullet infrastructure projects that are just going to somehow catch all the flood flows, hold them, and then make them, make them disappear. Um, we're not going to understand everything that has to do with flooding. Like I said, there's going to be more studies and more evaluations that need to, to follow this. Uh, and flood control projects that will significantly benefit water supply. I don't expect that we're going to see a lot of those. And I think intuitively that's something that makes sense, right? We're catching water. Why can't we use it then for water supply? Um, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. One is scale. And one is the fact that they're, they're so spread out, right? So you can either build a very, very large, this is a great idea. We're going to build a really big catchment to hold this water and serve as a water supply. We call, we call those reservoirs, right? We already do that. Um, so unless we're talking about building new reservoirs, that doesn't make a lot of sense because of the scale that's required. And in this region, we simply don't have the room, we don't have the geography in which to really do that in a meaningful way. The other is the fact that, that they're so spread out, right? So it's in aggregate, right? So a lot of this fluvial flooding that happens in the upland areas floods local areas. So you may be able to build, as part of your flood risk mitigation, a lot of smaller catchment uh, to slow that down, to retard the floods so that you knock the, the top off of that hydrograph. But then you've got to get some way of aggregating all of that up to a meaningful water supply. And those are huge challenges. Maybe something will come that's outside of the box, some innovation that will make that practical. But in terms of setting expectations, while that seems intuitive, there are a lot of reasons we haven't already done this. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and end my remarks, and we can move into the questions. That's on. All right. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, Wally. Appreciate hearing from you. Uh, so you may be wondering, what is a communications guy doing up here moderating this? And I, I, I admit, I'm just the dumb communications guy, so uh, I, I don't know engineer speak or hydrologists speak very well. And perhaps that's why I'm here, is to try to help translate that. And that's what we've done for years with Regency water planning groups, uh, public participation work, and now with the Trinity Region 3 uh, regional uh, flood planning process to try to translate some of this important infrastructure work that's being done into layperson's terms so the public knows, they know uh, what the process involves, and they know when and how to participate and why it matters. So um, I'm going to try to distill uh, a little bit of what we just heard and, and ask some questions that I think would be logical follow-up questions from the public, um, but then we want to open it up to your questions as well. Uh, so first of all, uh, Wally, you know, we We've learned a lot of new terminology <laughs> and acronyms from you. Obviously, it's extremely complicated, right? Trying to predict where the rain's going to fall and how that's going to affect uh, uh, the rivers and the streams and, and, and downstream. Um, so if I'm a local resident, I'm a business owner, uh, I'm a city official, a county official, you know, what's the best way to keep track of that in real time? And you told us how to communicate with the local uh, National Weather Service office if we know of issues that need to be corrected maybe in, in uh, local conditions, but in terms of just following what's going on, predicting the impact, preparing for it, because it's all about preparedness, right? Correct. The, the best way to explain it. The best way to explain it is, um, it's not because I'm the webmaster for the West Gopher Forecast Center, but uh, the web, the National Weather Service web pages, uh, we put out gridded uh, temperature forecast, gridded uh, precipitation forecast, uh, gridded observations. 
the surface observations from all the big airports around the area. Um, you know, there's radar, there's all that kind of stuff. So you can always do an app on your phone, and I'm not going to recommend an app because that would come across as an endorsement. Um, but the, the National Weather Service, you know, we quality control all of our data, and it, it's it's just a, a good way to, to, to first thing you do in the morning, you know, click it up. I know that uh, they will ask, you know, get over the radios. You know, that's the radio that would go off, tone alert in the middle of the night. So even if you're not watching TV, if there is severe weather in the area, it'll at least wake you up to make a personal decision for personal safety. But the National Weather Service web pages, there's always something there. Uh, we're developing information. Uh, the flood inundation maps will be put there. So it just dive in, you know, hit it every 15 minutes every morning while you enjoy a cup of coffee or a hot cup of tea, and, and stay situationally aware day to day. That's one thing I've learned uh, with you know my entire life in the state of Texas. Um, Mother Nature's going to throw you a curveball, uh, and the best way to, to handle it is be situationally aware. You know, don't expect that my forecast from yesterday is going to be valid today. I'd like to try to think it is. Every morning, just reset, look at the data, look at the observations. The rainfall data is going to be there. The, the temperature data is going to be there. And then the River Forecast Center, our, our forecast, with the help of the USGS and the Corps of Engineers, there's going to be a, a, all sorts of information so you can stay situationally aware. And the Weather Service web pages are one of the better places to find that. Good. Thank you. Uh, Glenn, we, we heard from you about the new regional flood planning process. And obviously, a lot is going to be happening very quickly as we try to do this initial uh, regional flood plan and then develop a state flood plan um, in basically the next year and a half, uh, two years, so and then five year cycles afterwards. So it's a very accelerated process the first time around. So if you are a local business leader, local official, how can the folks in this room help the regional flood planning group with that initial process? I think in, mostly in intangible ways, and that's just to be aware of the process and support the process. Um, you know, at this point, it's, it's doing its thing. We're, we're doing our work. We're gonna produce this product. Um, th there is a data need, and you know, we, we've been soliciting uh, engineering firms, municipalities, counties, anybody that, ha that has data that is germane to this process and, and trying to aggregate all that data. Of course, we can get overwhelmed pretty quickly uh, in, in that endeavor as well. So, um, you know, there, there isn't one action, I think, that we need to take at this point. I think we need to let this process play out. So just that, you know, being aware of it and, and that intangible support, uh, there, may be, there may be a day when we need tangible support, <laughs> uh, but we're not there yet. So I, I would say be, just be aware and be supportive of the process and, and um, um, yeah, let it play out. And, and I'll add as the communications guy, you can follow everything at trinityrfpg.org or our Absolutely. Twitter account, which is at trinityrfpg. Yeah. So, uh, att att attend the meetings and yeah, stay on top of it. Okay, great. Um, tell us a little bit more about funding. You alluded to uh, funding for future projects being one of the things that, that we can expect um, as, as hopefully a, a goal or an outcome of, of the planning effort over the long term. Yeah. So it, I know there's some key differences in how water projects are funded and how, um, you know, sort of the cyclical nature of that versus uh, right. maybe more sporadic nature for flood yeah. funding. So. Talk a little bit about that. So the, so the difference between funding for uh, water supply projects versus the funding for um, flood risk reduction projects. Yeah, that, it, it's pretty easy. One, one of those generates a revenue stream, right, water projects, uh, and, the, and the other is a cost avoidance mechanism. Um, and both of those can, you know, ret have multiple returns on your dollars, and, and I think, in fact, flood risk reduction probably has a better return than a water supply, just in, in sheer numbers, right, uh, than, than a water supply project does, though both are absolutely vital. When you build a reservoir, you're basically building a, a revenue stream, a commodity that can be sold, so it basically pays for itself. You can go issue debt, and that debt is issued based on the promise of that revenue stream. Um, if I want to go get insurance for my car, I can't get a loan to get insurance for my car, even though if I'm in an accident, that insurance is going to, is going to save me. Much like you know, flood risk reduction, if I make that investment, that capital has to come from somewhere. So that capital doesn't exist by virtue of that risk reduction method, right? So the legislature was well aware of this. Um, one of the things that they were very keen on was getting assistance to socially vulnerable areas to rural areas the municipalities have and, and i don't want to make it sound as frivolous as deep pockets because that money is coming out of our pockets right but there's a larger tax base there 
there's more sophistication, and they've taken care of a lot of these problems. Now, the problem is, I will say also, not, not to be cavalier, is we're not in a static environment. Development is changing the hydrology. It's the, changing the hydraulics as well. Both of those are important, how much water and how that water is moving. You know, we are looking at, at, at a changing climate, and we don't know if that's going to be temporary or long term. We don't really understand the, the history of it as well. So I think from that perspective, this region needs to be very much plugged into that process as well. But for those rural counties, one of the things that the legislature did in a companion bill, seven, uh, Senate Bill 7, they set aside $1.7 billion, and that's going to behave a lot like the SWIFT funding. Mostly that's going to be in low interest or no interest loans so that these communities can go out and get that capital that they need to implement these flood risk reduction projects. Great. Thank you. Um, Wally, we've seen even in the news this morning there's a prediction of a or there is a tropical disturbance uh, spinning up in the Gulf and talk about that turning into a depression or a storm, I, I suppose, in the next 24 hours or so, maybe? I, I can do that. Um, the beauty was on Monday, I looked at the best weather models we have, the American GFS and the European, and it said that there was going to rain 15 to uh, 20 inches of rain in Monterey, Mexico. Uh, by the time we get up this morning, this uh, tropical depression 9 has formed south of the Cayman Islands, and it is expected to go in somewhere between Lake Charles, Louisiana, and Slidell. So in four days, the best hurricane specialist in the world, you know, Mother Nature is, is you know, she's undefeated. Uh, right now, we're expecting it uh, to turn into Ida, make it, uh, first landfall in Cuba as a tropical storm, emerge into the Gulf of Mexico, and I'm not being facetious, it's bath water. It will intensify very rapidly. The current forecast has it as a category two hurricane somewhere, like I said, Lafayette area, maybe a little bit further east, um, but there's nothing to say that, that our models are a little slow and it could develop into a category three hurricane, a major hurricane, and make landfall within the same area as, as the four storms that hit last year. Um, so I don't want to, we learned in science, this is mother nature's way of moving heat around the globe. Now, this is a necessary feature. Uh, it's just the fact that, you know, we've built along our coast and when that moves inland, uh, they drop significant rainfall uh, amounts here. I, I want to point out that it's not just Atlantic storms either, Pacific storms. Uh, the remnants of Patricia, I believe, is the one that, that hit the uh, Richland Chambers area in October a couple years ago. Glenn mentioned that October is a secondary peak. It's because a lot of times we can get uh, a feed from Pacific moisture as well. So the situational awareness. You know, today, we got TD9. Tomorrow, it'll be Ida. Uh, we'll be talking about a major hurricane in the Gulf over the weekend. And then uh, reset and get ready because it, the, the peak of the hurricane season is September 8th, September 9th. So we're not even to the peak of our Atlantic season yet. There will be more, and if you don't get it this year, on average, Texas gets hit every other year with a tropical storm or hurricane. So, I mean, it's a big coastline, and it's vulnerable, but uh, it's just something, situational awareness. I, I think it, we have to prepare that it is going to happen. What do we do when the big rain event hits my area, my municipality? So stay alert, stay prepared. Right. So it seems that in our talk beforehand and, and today, we've heard a lot about interconnectivity, and that seems to be a recurrent theme, uh, not only with flood planning, but really for all of the days, infrastructure discussions, uh, so much interconnectivity between political entities uh, in the region, and weather systems interacting with one another, just uh, anything you want to expand on there with just the importance of interconnectivity and how this all plays out in terms of flood planning in the region uh, and statewide, or interconnectivity in terms of forecasting? Yeah, sure, I've got some thoughts on that, Mo mostly in the political realm. Um, th and that's one of the things that I've been keenly aware of, and I'm going to stay, on, I'm going to do my best to stay on top of throughout this entire process, is you, you've got a major metropolitan area, which I think is where the vast majority of us are, are from, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And that area, as we've seen, and when Wally had some great satellite imagery that showed that, that sprawl, uh, and you're adding rooftops, and you're adding parking lots, and you're when the water hits a roof, it runs off pretty fast, right? And so the same amount of water moving through a channel now uh, may cause flooding when it didn't before because it's moving much faster and so that hydrograph has a, has a much sharper peak to it. Um, and so when, when we're looking at downstream connectivity because that water, you know, exits in the metroplex and, and, and when we're looking at solutions, one of the solutions that, that, that um, people tend to look at is levees because that fixes your problem. You can put a levee along the river and 
it keeps it from going into you know a larger natural floodplain because you know we've built infrastructure there so we're trying to protect that infrastructure but again what that does is it moves that water a lot faster downstream and it compresses that peak and it can actually make flooding worse downstream um, so we need to be very very aware of not only how our development impacts downstream but how our solutions impact downstream flooding because what we don't want to do is give the impression to the middle trinity and the lower trinity that the flooding that they're experiencing is our fault and then when they go back to the legislature and say this this flood planning process isn't working we need to fix it it needs to be restrictive uh, instead of a may we're going to now, now be in a shall world um, and i think that would work contrary to everybody's best interests so one of the things that we need to be very aware of is how, not only the reality of how we implement those projects, but also how it's perceived. And so we need to make sure that those folks are at the table, that understand exactly what's going on, that understand those solutions. And we need to be sensitive to that uh, because I think that's a very, very real political uh, possibility, especially looking at the, you know, the divided political world that we, we live in. So um, I think my most important job is hurting these cats and, and uh, keeping that upstream downstream um, unity, if you will. Yeah. Very important. That's why it's a region-wide process, and why we really do want input from from across the region. Yeah, and that's a good point. And th and that's when when we lobbied to create a region that included the entire Trinity River Basin, that was really forefront in our calculus. And that is not creating some artificial artificial divide in the middle where everybody downstream felt like they were disenfranchised. They were, you know, it would be basically a region C, region D conflict if you're familiar with the water supply world. So you're, you'd almost be guaranteeing, in my opinion, um, that that disconnect, that animosity that could could um, complicate the process. Uh, we're, we've got just a few minutes left, I think, in our uh, panel time. So. Um like to open it up to questions. Uh, so, yeah. Hey, with Glenn, with everybody moving here to Texas from everywhere else, uh, water planting, they're making provisions for water supply. Mm -hmm. With what you guys are doing, after a while you get a feel for where everybody's moving to. Is it your anticipation that the work that y'all are doing will somehow impact development permits for these communities as to where they can build? how much they can build, single family versus multifamily versus commercial? I, I think the short answer is no. Um, ancillarily, it might through roundabout processes, but that will be initiated at the local level. And when I was alluding to uh, avoiding a situation where the legislature starts coming in and getting much more involved, that's the kind of local control that I'm trying to preserve. So that, that, so that this body, this group, um, through, through the will of the legislature, the Texas Water Development Board isn't in that position. There are some things that we can do. We can set some, and again, all of this is, there, this is really only carrot. There's no stick right now to the flood planning process. Being in the flood plan with a project puts you in line to access the funding. So it's really just, can you access that funding? Um, so we can, we can set requirements for building codes, for you know, preservation of floodplains, we haven't decided that we're going to do that. We don't know how we would do that, uh, what it would look like, so to speak. Even then, though, you would only have to adhere to those or adopt those if you were interested in getting access to the funding through Senate Bill 7. And I want to jump in, being the, uh, the scientist here. The studies that's going to be completed are going to show areas that are more prone. Uh, Mother Nature is going to make sure that they're going to blow your studies out of the water at least once. So, you know, even if we put in you know, well, this is a flood prone area, and it, the studies are going to come back and show, look at all these areas that we've identified that, that maybe have a higher flood risk. All it takes is the one storm in the one area, uh, and then all the, the statistics go out the window. So uh, the preparedness aspect, um, I, I'm thankful I'm on the, you know, as a, as a basically a scientific advisor with this group. Um, I think that the information is going to be key for all of us, uh, but we're still going to have to make that decision when the big event happens. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, William, is there any mechanism by which the various 15 watershed planning groups, regional planning groups, uh, compare best practices or compare information? From, I know the watersheds are 
they're all over the place in different but is there a way or a mechanism yeah, th there is. Um, it, th the big one, obviously, is going to be at the end when the Texas Water Development Board has to consolidate everything. But as we're developing these plans, um, we have meetings of the chairs where all the chairs get together and we talk about the issues that we're seeing. Um, it, and there, there are a number of different uh, venues like that where the consultants get involved and there has been a tremendous amount of information sharing. Up till now, it's, it's mostly been administrative. You know, how are you doing this? How are you dealing with that? How are we going to deal with open meetings um, if half the people won't show up because they're concerned about Delta variant, et cetera? But yes, there, there are those mechanisms in place. I don't know how, but I also know that the consultants are also talking amongst themselves and sharing information, which I think is an intelligent thing to do. Um, yeah, so, so that you are ensuring that best practices are being used, I don't know about uniformly, but somewhat uniformly, yeah, across the state. Yeah, we, we do have liaisons on the team. The, the liaison, the intent of the liaisons was really for, for basins that were divided. And I think that would be paramount. So if we had drawn a line in the middle of the Trinity, obviously we'd have somebody from the lower or middle Trinity and the upper Trinity uh, sitting on that group who could really um, relay the, the interests and represent that, that lower basin. Uh, here it's adjoining coastal basins, so it's, it does, it does provide, you're right, absolutely right, it does provide another avenue for sharing and dissemination of information. You mentioned your presentation about potential water supply with the flooding improvements. Could there potentially be water rights issues associated with this as far as if you're going to be taking water, can you put it in the ground or can you store it? At 100%, absolutely, um, and that's one of the complications that would that would need to be to be sorted out. It would basically be capturing excess water, so you would have to get a water rights permit. TCQ would have to examine that. They would have to make sure that you're not going to injure any senior water rights holders downstream. So if it's flood flows, um, one of the conditions we have is Livingston has to be full and spilling. If it's flood flows, chances are there's there's excess water. Um, and so only under that, those situations could you gain access to that water. And you may be required to, to pass it once the flood peak is gone. You may be required to let that go downstream. If Livingston isn't full and you've captured water that would otherwise fill up Lake Livingston, yeah, we, we want it. You're going to have to send that downstream. Um, but there are some opportunities there. The other side is the, you know, the environmental side, and that is are we depriving the bay of those peak flows. And if we ever got to this to the position where we could really capture every last drop, which I don't think is practical, theoretically, then we'd have concerns about the bay. And there are environmental stream flows that protect the bay. And so those are the two criteria that would have to be met. So you're absolutely right, Matt. You've got to make sure that you're not injuring senior water rights holders, you'd be last in line, and you've got to make sure that you're meeting the environmental flow criteria. So, but good point, excellent point. And then I'll throw it in. Um, I worked as a liaison for the Mississippi River flooding of 2011, uh, where they opened up the Old Town Channel and diverted to the Shafalaya. And that's a whole nother, that was a, a diversion of excess flood water, you know, from what, 1.5 million cubic feet per second. They sent 300,000 down the Shafalaya River by opening up a, a gate and transferring basins. That's another whole, you know, in a regional flood group that would have to be taken into account, aside with water rights, is what gives you the right to flood me when your river over there is the one flooding? And I know that there have been people asking me, hey, you're a fed, can you do something about this? And I just, I plead ignorance on it, but uh, that is another possibility that if any of these regional flood groups come up with a, an interbasin or cross basin transfer, we know it happens in mother nature. During Harvey, the Colorado jumped over into the Brazos and the Brazos jumps over to Oyster Creek and the Colorado jumped into the San Bernard. So we know that it can happen naturally. Uh, and I'm not sure if the science aspect is gonna grasp that on all of these regional flood planning groups. So bottom line, it's all very, very complex. But uh, get us your data. We, we want it. We need it. And uh, we can do our best to plan. And we're learning, learning a lot about this new process as we go. Any other wait, time for one more question, I think? Uh, anybody have a final question? Can we answer them all? Yes. How are the projects being developed? I mean, obviously, in the region C plan, you know, each, each, each city or each entity says, I'm going to yeah, it's going to be a very, very similar process, and, and, and we're nowhere close to that. But the yeah, they'll, and there's another big difference. Um, and so, if you normally on the water supply side, you've got a champion who's bringing that to the table, who has the 
you know, the resources to develop that project and bring it forward. Um, this, is gonna be, this is gonna be a little bit different. The process will be the same, but you don't have those champions necessarily for some of these other areas. And those are precisely the areas, I think, who can benefit from these projects. So I'm hoping the enticement of the, uh, the grant monies that some of the consultants can then pursue, so where your interests kind of align, so those consultants can kind of fill that gap, provided by the funding um, from the Texas Water Development Board, and bring those projects forward. But that process will be the same. So you'll, you'll have a list of projects that people are gonna have to bring to the group, and then the group will analyze those projects and then move those forward, decide, you know, prioritize those, and then decide which make it into the plan. Good question. And I, I do have one more yep. uh, comment, and I just wanna make sure that we haven't sounded too pessimistic. Um, and I, I wanna make sure that the tone that I've set isn't there's nothing we can do, you know, set these really, really low expectations. There's a lot that we can do. And I think those solutions are gonna be at the local, they're gonna be most meaningful at the local level. And in aggregate, those local solutions will absolutely roll up. So if you're, talk, if you're taking care of some of the pluvial, the upland flooding, which is very important for a city like Dallas or Arlington or Hearst or what, wherever you are, um, then you're helping to take care of that downstream flooding as too. So back to that interconnection. But I, I wanted to make sure that we, we set the right tone. There's a lot that we can do, and I look forward to getting a lot of that done and, and having a meaningful impact on flood risk reduction in Texas. I want to counter that. Yes, I am pessimistic. If you ever hear my voice on TV, in the radio, it's because there's a whole lot of water coming your way, so I am pessimistic. You don't ever want to hear from me except in environments like this. So, you know, in that case, if, if this triggers a, an emotional response, I heard that voice, there's something going on to, to prepare for it. My goal is to provide you all the information best possible. We're working with Glenn and his group all the time. Um, there are solutions. Uh, even as a scientist, I can say there are solutions. We just got to find them. And that's the beauty of these, these flood groups is that they're, they're, they're bringing some of the best minds together to come up with what is best for that group. Why we prepare and plan. All right, thank you so much to our panelists. Thank, thank you all for being here today. Thank you all. Thanks to the NTC for hosting us.